Okay. You, at least hey, I think we'll get going. Whenever we have these conferences and you have a coffee break, I, I'm usually the cat herder out front, and I'm, today I got tapped to be the um, moderator, the moderate moderator for the second panel, so uh, Pia had to be my cat herder today. Um, well, welcome to the second panel. Um, I <clears throat> am not Don Newman. I do not have Don Newman's television voice, uh, nor his demeanor, nor do I have his 30 years of interview experience. So we will, it will be a different experience here, although I appreciate Don's excellent work. Um, and you can see where he was a professional, and that's not my skill set. Um, but welcome to the second panel on uh, cooperation between Arctic and non-Arctic nations. And I think we started a hint at that during the first panel. Um, we will go for the almost the full hour and a half, um, and I'm going to tell Pia that her f concluding remarks will be short <laughs> or fast. Okay. Well, we, as uh, as Don said, the bios are in the uh, the packet, but I did want to point out some things of the people who are in the panel with us. Franz Tönnies next to me is a member of the German Parliament um, for the Social Democratic Party. He represents the district of Segeberg, uh, Stormann Nord, which lies to the south of Kiel, sort of up in northern Germany. Um, he's been a longtime member of the Baltic Sea Parliamentary Conference and has worked uh, diligently on that. To his left is Ted McDorman, who is a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Um, Ted has written a lot on ocean policy and uh, ocean law and international trade and Arctic stuff, and he's a fascinating guy. He was, interestingly for what we're doing here, 2002-2004 academic in residence with the Bureau of Legal Affairs with the Department of Foreign Affairs. So he has some taint to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was also, um, I was happy that he was our Fulbright Visiting Chair in Canada-US Relations um, several years ago, a great colleague. And to his left, I'm um, Timo Koivarova, who is research professor and director of the Northern Institute for Environmental and Minority Law at the University of Lapland. He's also done a lot of work on different levels of environmental law, um, indigenous peoples, law of the sea and the Arctic, et cetera, which is why we grabbed him to come here. Um, and I appreciate the long flight that he took to get here um, and joining us in Ottawa as well. So let me stop there, and I will turn to um, Hans for his presentation. Thank you very much, David. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, first like to thank the organizers for inviting us to today's um, conference. And I thank both organizations uh, for putting a topic on the agenda that uh, merits being moved into the focus of public interest and of parliaments. It is an honor and pleasure for me to be able to present to you today the arguments from a German and the European perspectives that make it clear why we in Germany and the European Union are actively committed to stepping up cooperation between Arctic and non-Arctic nations. The fact that we are meeting here today shows that uh, this topic is of interest to us all. And that is a good thing, since we are all affected by it. Affected by the changes occurring in the Arctic, the associated challenges, the opportunities and risks. The ice crust in the far north is melting incredibly fast. The Arctic is becoming more accessible to people and their diverse activities. There are large oil and natural gas deposits beneath the Arctic Ocean. Reputable research has established uh, that just under 25% of the world's oil, gas, uh, oil and gas reserves are located in the Arctic. And then there are potential deposits of base and rare earth metals. All this has a bearing on both the interests of the countries bordering on the Arctic, the big industrialized nations, and even China. Once the Northwest and the Northeast passages are free of ice, new cereals will considerably reduce journey times between Europe and North America and Asia. At the moment, the Arctic has a unique flora and fauna that needs to be preserved and protected. They are one with the indigenous peoples in this region and from part of the cultural heritage of humanity. Then there are also questions concerning administration, sovereign territories, and the safe and sustainable use of the new opportunities that are going up. The associated challenges we face together must not be regarded in isolation, nor can they be tackled in isolation. They require answers for which we are jointly 
responsible, for a region for which we are jointly responsible. What German and European interest can thus be derived from this in regard to cooperation with Arctic and non-Arctic nations? In view of climate change and rising sea levels, mention should first be made of Germany's coastline of just under 2,400 kilometers and the coastline of 20 of the 27 member states of the European Union, which stretches across a total of 66,000 kilometers. The EU coastline is thus seven times long as the United States and four times as long as Russia's. The EU is surrounded by four seas and two oceans, and thus it is clear that we cannot be indifferent to a region whose melting ice sheet, volumes of water and temperatures have a direct impact on Germany and Europe. A second aspect is the weight we attach to the principle of sustainable both in Germany and in Europe sustainability, both in Germany and in Europe. The climate conference in Copenhagen underlined that fact. It uh, in particular applies to preserving the common heritage of humanity in the Arctic. We want as much multilateral action as possible here. The same goes for our interests as a big economy and uh, for the common European market. Germany imports 97% of its oil and 84% percent of its gas demand, mainly from Russia and Norway. Even if we do our utmost to replace fossil fuels, we will still, for the foreseeable future, be dependent on oil and especially on gas, <laughs> it being a clean energy source. That is why in Germany we have a great interest in the technical aspects of tapping into these sources and in the prudent use of oil and gas reserves available in the Arctic all the while adhering to sustainable criteria. Another national, natural resource is also of great interest to the EU and likewise to Germany. In Germany, we import 87% of our fish demand. 23% of that share is fished in the Arctic region. And uh, the currents, the levels of oxygen, and the salt in the EU's fishing grounds are influenced by climate change in the Arctic. The melting of the ice worries us on the one hand, but it also opens up new opportunities. I already mentioned, and we discussed it before, new shipping passage. Germany's ship owners operate the world's biggest container fleet. Shorter sea routes are appealing. The sea route from Hamburg to uh, Shanghai will be cut from 25,000 kilometers to 70,000 kilometers once the Northwest Passage is open. This will have an impact on ports and shipping companies in Northern Europe. Another important area of interest to Germany is research in the Arctic. Kaldewey, the renowned polar research station operated by the Alfred Wegener Institute, is located in Svalbard on Spitsbergen. As a contracting party to the Spitsbergen Treaty, Germany is also, if I may be so bold as to say it, a recognized research nation especially when it comes to the Arctic. Not least also on account of the fact that we have always adopted an international research approach, as is also the case with the planet construction of the German super icebreaker, the Aurora Bolaris, which will be able to investigate the seabed at any time of the year and to bore on the continental shelf. Against the backdrop, I have already outlined stability in the region is absolutely essential from Europe's and Germany's point of view. Looking back to the Iron Certain area, it does not appear entirely wrong to speak of a kind of frozen conflict. It now appears as if the melting ice is also laying bare areas of conflict that were previously frozen over. However, it should be in all our interest not to allow any disputes to erupt or rather to find bilateral or multilateral responses to any unanswered questions that do come up in negotiations and by means of reliable agreements. From the EU's and Germany's perspective, we cannot allow any major disputes to arise over who is authorized to commercially develop an enlarged continental shelf. But numerous military movements make it clear 
that recourse is first being taken to the kind of demonstrations of strength and power which we know well from the past, including submarine missile tests, maneuvers and patrol flights, using strategic bombers, plans for missile defense systems, stacking up patrols uh, or the announcement of new military facilities in the Arctic. And uh, just as Russia demonstratively plants a Russian flag on the seabed at what is purported to be the North Pole, NATO declares the Northern Territories a strategically important region for the alliance. All of which occurs along the border between NATO member states and Russia in the far north. Activities that do not exactly indicate that the region is entirely conflict free. What can be done to meet the challenges and make use of the opportunities? Implementing existing agreements, frameworks and treaties and complete respect for the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea are of primary importance. And these agreements must also be taken forward. The Convention of the Law of the Sea does regulate how the marine environment is to be protected and preserved, but often in a very general fashion that is open to interpretation. I beg the call made in March 2008 by the then British Foreign Minister Jack Straw and the then German Foreign Minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier when they said the following. It is of vital importance that structures be put in place for the Arctic region that are based on international law, that aim at the cooperative and peaceful commercial exploitation of resources and at preserving our ecological heritage. This concurs with the goals of the European Union, security and stability, strict environmental management based on the precautionary principle and the sustainable use of resources and free and equal access. Preserving the unique climate conditions is the number one task in the Arctic. The ecosystem in that region needs maximum protection and safeguards. A legally binding framework for action is required to that end. Article 197 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea sets out the prospect of close cooperation to preserve the marine environment. We must now assess whether initiatives for a legally binding framework in the Arctic region can be derived from the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Arctic Treaty, which entered into force in 1998 and made the Arctic a protected area for 50 years. Up until now, the Convention on the Law of the Sea has classified the high seas of the Arctic Ocean as belonging to the common heritage of humanity. We must resolve the issue of how the environmental interests and other concerns of the international community can be safeguarded should the national outer continental shelf significantly increase in size and should thus the region classified as belonging to the common heritage of humanity shrink. I'm in favor of stepping up work in existing bodies. For instance, the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf and the International Seabed Authority. We could imagine questions concerning the common heritage of humanity, in other words, the interest of the international community in joint and sustainable use of the Arctic resources being included. For instance, in the decisions of the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. In late May 2008, five countries bordering on the Arctic Ocean met in Ilulisat and agreed common rules for meeting the challenges we face in the Arctic. The international law of the sea was described as a solid foundation on the basis of which responsible regulations could be found for the continental shelf, marine eventual protection, freedom of navigation and marine research. The goal is for the five states to cooperate with other interest parties on protecting the unique Arctic ecosystem. The talk is also of cooperation on emergency measures. Safety at sea is to be guaranteed by means of bilateral and multilateral agreements between or among the affected nations. Cooperation is also mentioned when it comes to collecting oceanographic data on the continental shelf. Regardless of the fact that only the five immediately affected Arctic nations attended the meeting, I very much welcome the positions they adopted. They underline the significance of the international law of the sea, in particular the UN's 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea, and they include the will to cooperate with third-party nations. 
countries that do not border on the Arctic Ocean should also take up this wish, this offer. Also, naturally, the question arises of what form that cooperation should take. The EU and Germany advocate strengthening the Arctic Regions Council as a whole, together with representatives of indigenous people. The topics it addresses should go beyond important environmental issues and should also cover security-relevant matters. The EU should be given permanent observer status, and the guidelines developed by the Council should be made binding. And I would like to add the following questions. Would it even be justified to give those qualified states that have no territorial claims in the Arctic the right to vote on the Council? Questions coming up before. Could the Arctic Region Council also be used as a forum to discuss how we can draw up regulations and control mechanisms specific to the Arctic region for sustainable fishing management in the Arctic Ocean? The same applies to, applies to maintaining the quality of polar research. This is of paramount importance for the international community. Research needs to be independent. How and where can guarantees be set down so that future polar research remains independent even when the national outer continental shelf is enlarged and new shipping passages are open, especially given the fact that these new sea routes are as yet relatively unsecured? It could be of an advantage in regard to confidence building to design common systems for monitoring shipping, for securing sea routes, emergency response planning, and for search and rescue measure measures. Of course, we also need to use all the available options to discuss issues specific to the Arctic in the Barents Sea, Euro, Euro Arctic Council, and in the context of the committees of the Northern Dimension, in the NATO Russia Council, as well as in all parliamentary assemblies. For instance, the EU should use its membership of the Committee of Parliamentarians of the Arctic Region to a greater extent to bring an influence to bear and to ensure there is more coordination of activities. The same applies to the Northern Dimension. Parliamentary forums, second meeting next year in Tromsø. The forum compromises parliamentary representatives from the Arctic region, including Canada, the United States, Norway and Iceland, as well as representatives of the European Parliament, the Baltic Sea Parliamentary Conference, of EU institutions and governments. It is also justified to ask whether it will really be possible to deal with security policy issues in the Arctic in the long term without an institutional framework. So far, the Arctic Region Council has explicitly not had a security policy mandate. I mentioned the increase in military activities. Do we not therefore also need a framework in which answers to these questions could also be found? And could that not be the Arctic Council? In early 2009, the former Norwegian Foreign Minister Torvald Stoltenberg published a report on behalf of the Nordic Council for five of its members entitled Nordic Cooperation on Foreign and Security Policy. Perhaps the certain recommendations for the five Nordic nations contained in the report that was later named after him also provide a point of reference for the whole of the Arctic region. Just as the melting ice is opening up the oceans, many legal questions in the Arctic are still open. They include the reach of the national outer continental shelf, sections of maritime borders and Arctic waters, such as the Beaufort Sea or the Bering Strait, the legal nature of shipping routes, the territorial status of individual Iceland. I'm thinking here of the small Hans Island, Island for example, the concrete scope of Arctic-specific clauses in the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Many, a legal issue can no doubt be answered on a bilateral basis, as Russia and Norway showed in April 2010 after more than 40 years of arguing over their border in the Barents Sea. When I consider the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg, the question arises of whether it would sometimes not be obvious thing to do to ask this tribunal for an expert opinion or a judgment when such questions are at issue. This could no doubt help to further strengthen the foundations laid by the international law of the sea and to build up upon those foundations. The Arctic needs those nations bordering on it and all those others that are honestly concerned and want to face up the new challenges in the Arctic to commit to working together. In my view, 
It is important to use our existing institutions, organizations and parliamentary assemblies to find solutions to contentious issues before a real conflict breaks out. Surely the, surely the advice that affected nations should get involved more is more useful with a view to achieving good results than reducing the number of those involved, which only gives renewed cause for speculation. By taking joint action, we should move away from the idea that the Arctic belongs to me and realize that the Arctic belongs to us, so that we can create a framework in which agreements and treaties are used to replace a system where the strongest rule with the strengths of a system where the rules are determined jointly. The Arctic deserves no less. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Franz. Um, Ted, you're up. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everyone. A lot of what I had uh, thought I might be saying has already been said, so let me make some disclaimers. Um, this is Betsy Baker's um, PowerPoint. I'm proud to use PowerPoint once in a while, but I find out I steal other people's PowerPoints mostly. <laughs> Secondly, um, I am a lawyer. Those of you who wish to leave the room is a good idea, and I I look at the Arctic um, a bit as an international lawyer, and worse than that, I'm an international ocean lawyer, so I'm not a political geotheorist, or whatever, and I'm not a scientist, and I make no apologies for that particularly. Uh, I did work with the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs, but I'm sure that your Canadian people watching will be happy to know I definitely don't speak for the government of Canada <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, and they made very clear that I didn't even while I worked there, um, which is perhaps just as well. I have a couple of comments, and I think the first thing to start off is, is the Arctic Ocean different legally, climatically, and any other way you want to think about than every other ocean? And I see some people nodding, yes it is. No, now she's changed her mind. She just thought it was a good question. <laughs> it was a good question. Well, I thought it was a good question, too. An awful lot of the discussion that has arisen around the Arctic is the idea that the Arctic Ocean is different somehow. And that may be the case. I can't take, a, I don't have the perspective of Brooks Yeager and others who do serious science work around the Arctic. I do look at it legally, however, and the answer that comes back is no. As a matter of international law, the Arctic Ocean is no different than the Atlantic Ocean. It is different than the Baltic, for a variety of reasons. It's even a little bit different than the Mediterranean Sea, although Canada would be happy, I'm sure, to participate in anything that's going on in the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> so the Arctic Ocean is another ocean, legally speaking. It is not, I hesitate, I make clear, it is not a lake that is divided up by the countries around it. The Arctic Ocean is inherently international. There's no attempt on the part of any of the Arctic Five states, and by the Arctic Five, and I'm talking just about the central Arctic Ocean. I'm not talking about the Barents Sea. I'm not talking about the Bering Sea. I'm talking about the central Arctic Ocean, which I'm going to step away from the podium, which is largely this area, okay? Not here, and not in the Bering, which doesn't show up on the map. Here you have five states that frame the Arctic Ocean. You have the Russians, by far the major player in the We miss that sometimes. They are the major player. Not only are they the major geographically, they have the most people in the Arctic. They have serious cities in the Arctic Ocean, in the central Arctic Ocean basin. Canada is the second largest. The United States would be third in terms of just framing the issue. Denmark, Greenland, would be there as well, and of course that has interesting issues between Denmark and Greenland. What if Greenland becomes an independent state, which they are slowly moving towards? And then we have Norway through Svalbard, and Svalbard has its own particular area. This is the area that I'm talking about. Listen to the countries for a second. United States, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, Norway, and Russia. These are all countries that have 
and I'll rush out, I'll put a, a little asterisk beside, all have significant environmental records that are positive, that are doing positive things, all believe in ecosystem management, all believe in the precautionary approach, all are environmentally responsible in, a whole, in different ways, perhaps, but are all doing as well, if not better, than just about every other country there is including on global climate change. While several countries in this region, perhaps the United States, is not a party to the Kyoto, it's not fair to say that the United States is not making progress in a lot of different ways, domestically and otherwise, on global climate change. So we're not talking about countries that need to be lectured about how to handle the marine environment or any environment, just as a point. So the Arctic Ocean is the same ocean as other oceans, but it is international. There's no question about that. Cooperation inherently is important between the Arctic five states, both bilaterally, globally, in any number of ways. But what I do want to say is that the relationships in terms of cooperation do vary a little bit on function. What we often talk about and what often gets talked about is the need for a, you know, is the, I'm going to say the Antarctic Silence Treaty, but a, a, a regional treaty that is specific to the Arctic. We don't talk about that for the Atlantic Ocean. We don't talk about that for the Pacific Ocean. We do talk about it for the Arctic. That perplexes me slightly. Um, but that's okay. Everyone has different perspectives on that in, diff in, in different ways. Um, I think that, that reality of a sort of an Arctic specific treaty, and I do mean treaty and not sort of an Arctic Council structure, is probably something to be considered. But I don't think it has legs. I don't think it's going to happen in any particular way. Um, but I think what we have to, and then we, then sometimes the conversation becomes, well then the Arctic Five are not interested in international cooperation. If we're not going for a treaty, we're not interested in cooperation. Well, I don't think that's even remotely accurate. So I think what we need to look, do, and what I want to do for my um, 6.7 minutes, is, um, is to look at some of the, the specific areas where cooperation, and, and where international cooperation either exists or is needed. The other thing to point out is that it's not unique to the Arctic that there are governance gaps in the world. There's governing gaps in the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, we could do better on protection of the environment. The Arctic is no different. We can do better and we should do better. But to focus specifically on the Arctic and say, bah, because we can't solve all the problems, we need to have something uniquely Arctic oriented is, is a bit of a misunderstanding. It's a little bit of northern lights focus. People get in love with, I think they get snow blind. I just thought of that. They get a little snow blind about the Arctic and they forget, no, the Arctic Ocean actually ties in with all the other oceans. The other, with the greatest of respect to my German colleague, <laughs> if the Germans really wanted to do something, they could stop global climate change in Germany because most of the prop, he's very good at the effect on Germany, but what about the cause? The cause is inherently international. A little more attention to that by all of us would not have to worry so much perhaps about the effects, which is mostly what he was talking about. The effects on Germany are this, but the cause of the ice, that is global, no question. All right, shipping activity. This is intensely international. We all know that. Ships come from around the world. They come from Germany. <clears throat> German owned, not German flagged. Cruise ships filled with German citizens. Want to solve some climate problems? Want to solve some Arctic problems? Stay home. <laughs> blunt? Am I blunt, David? <laughs> Just kidding. Shipping activity is intensely international. We all know that. The International Maritime Organization on shipping polar co with the Polar Code that we hope will be mandatory at some point will set standards for vessels going into the Arctic and hopefully also uh, in the Antarctic and things like that. There are sensitivities to do with the Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage which have been described and I'm happy to answer questions on that in excruciating detail. Uh, for the most part, Canada and the United States, we cooperate to uh, disagree and sometimes, you know what, that's okay. Amongst lawyers, agreeing to disagree allows you to go and have a beer afterwards and still get the job done. So it's, it's, it's okay. So shipping activity is intensely international. Of course, cooperation is absolutely necessary in all sorts of uh, different ways. Um, Canada and the Russians do have some regulations that are specific 
to shipping that are not internationally based, but they have the authority to do so under the Law of the Sea Convention. So there is going to be some, quote, unilateralism on the part of Canada. We're very protective of our Arctic Waters Pollution Prevention Act and quite proud of that, I would think, because it was the first environmental legislation in the Arctic. We were there first. The Russians were not far behind. Although there's never been any indication of collusion, I think they colluded. And the Russians have also been doing, um, and, and that's, that's okay. So some unilateralism on shipping, but at the end of the day, shipping is international. So we are going to have, and we are having, and there's intense international negotiation and discussions about shipping. Fishing. Fishing within 200 nautical mile zones is a national event. In the high Arctic, there's going to be a high seas area beyond 200 nautical miles. The science I heard last week, and I'm looking at my friend here, Brooks, in case he nods his head up or down or sideways, uh, that the, the likelihood of significant fishing beyond 200 nautical miles in the high Arctic was put at just about zero in the near future. Now, my idea of near future and your idea of near future, I don't know, but it's going to be a while. Okay, um, so that's going to be mostly, there will, international cooperation may not actually be necessary on fisheries, except in the high seas, and that's in the future. Oil and gas activity, the authorization and the um, uh, permitting of oil and gas is a strictly national event. It is not an international event. The international event comes up in terms of the repercussions and the standards that are used for the actual drilling activities themselves. Um, even that is national in some respect. The, the incidence of a pollution from an oil and gas activity, now that has international, but to be fair, it's mostly bilateral. There is reason to have uh, standards on this. These are being worked on, but it is important to understand that regardless of where the continental <laughs> shelf goes, and it's going to go a long way, uh, both Canada, the United States, the Russians are all making significant uh, efforts to indicate where their continental shelf goes. And that is consistent with the treaty. That is a right that every country has. We're not, you know, and to suggest that Canada or the Russians or the United States are going to give up that right is is a bit of a problem. So it's not actually a discussion of the debate between the common heritage of humankind and the coastal state. The common heritage of humankind, which is the mineral resources of the deep ocean floor that is left after a state has simply exercised the right that it already has. So it's not that debate, that debate isn't quite as, as uh, put in the same way. Um, marine science, of course, is open. It's inherently international in all of the countries. I can't speak for the Russians here, but the Canadians and the Americans and the Danes and the Norwegians say, if you're a scientist and you want to come to the Arctic, as long as you come safely, come on up. That ain't changing. Sorry, my ain't isn't very well. My, this, sorry, this, th that isn't changing. That's inherently international. And that's a good thing. There's no country of the Arctic Five that's trying to stop that. Marine environmental protection as a generic sense. Again, I've mentioned all the countries believe in ecosystem management, whatever that means. All are doing with large marine ecosystems, whatever that means. All are dealing with precaution, perhaps not quite the European understanding of precaution, which has a tendency, again, a little blunt for a second, not to do anything, uh, but a precaution that takes into account sustainable development and all those kinds of issues. Um, that is, uh, in sort of marine environmental protection, we have countries that are doing that. Nevertheless, marine environment is an international event of sorts, giving respect to the 200 nautical mile zone within a, which a country has a certain amount of domestic responsibilities. And as I said, in a marine environment, of course, the biggest threat to the marine environment in the Arctic is global climate change, which is an inherently international, is not Arctic Five. And of course, the Arctic Five are going to feel the effects long before Germany does. Existing international governance structures, always room for improvement, no question about it. Um, just exactly where those gaps might be, I don't know. I'm not a big Arctic Council. I love the Arctic Council. The difficulty of the Arctic Council, which you have to be careful about, is it deals with land and ocean. I don't think you're going to find an Arctic Council having management responsibility over the land. Because that is inherently, if you're, Germany is going to give up its authority to the Arctic Council over the land, then we're all for it. But otherwise, I think it's a bit of a problem. On the ocean, I take Betsy Baker, who I agree with on everything at all times, as a matter of principle, including restaurant choices, uh, <laughs> that you know, there are things the Arctic Council may be able to have management responsibility for, or at least be able to create uh, an international instrument of very specific types and very specific issues. And just what those are, we may or may not agree with. Um, David's giving me the uh, you're way over time uh, look. He doesn't actually say anything, he just looks at you. 
Um, there's room for a lot of constructive engagement. We have to move away from the idea that the Arctic is being, that, that, there's a, that we have to accept the idea that the Arctic Ocean is another ocean, that it's inherently international. Nevertheless, there are certain areas, certain subject areas, that are within the, the national jurisdiction of the states, and that that's not going to be easily yielded in any particular way. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> Timo. <clears throat> <laughs> you want it, you want it fuzzy? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone and kind thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this very in interesting seminar. I think this is the first time I've, I'm, I have been invited to, to represent a non-Arctic state, being a fin Finnish person. <laughs> so that's a bit of a stretch for me. So I'm going to try to give that perspective. So uh, I'm going to be basically trying to answer the same, same uh, uh, questions that, that were posed to the other panelists. I, I, I will, in the fourth one, I will just throw in some uh, questions for discussion. And I, will, I think that the, 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 the whole framing of the seminar being about states, I think that we need to, to look also in the indigenous peoples in the region. Okay, the first question, um, I don't think that the Arctic Council or the Barents Euro-Arctic region with its two levels of gov governance, there is a, 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 a state a level and commission involved and, and county level governance, they do not address security threats, at least in the traditional sense of the term, um, that do not really do any, any really uh, strong environmental regulation. Um, the Barents Euroarctic region does a lot of uh, um, economic cooperation. Arctic Council addresses environmental issues, um, especially through its its uh, assessments. So spotlighting uh, what are the environmental problems in the region, and mainly coming from outside the region, at least so far. Okay, the second question. And uh, I, I just want to give a, 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 a my view on, 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 on what is Arctic. So who are and are not Arctic states? It's, it's an interesting question always. Who are and are not A5 Arctic Ocean coastal states? And what's the role of the EU? So let's look at the map this here. So here you can see the 60th parallel. It's been enveloped. Only, only two states are being enveloped by, by that uh, parallel, and those, those are Finland and, and Iceland. And, and primarily the main population uh, centers and, and political power centers are to the south in other Arctic states. Who are then Arctic Five? Um, you heard that it's Denmark, you heard that it's Norway. Denmark is a member state to the European Union. Norway is an EFTA state. It is bound by European Economic Area Agreement, meaning that much of the uh, reg regulations done in the European Union becomes binding on, on Norway plus Iceland, because Iceland is also on, an EFTA state. But if, if you look at the, the, from the EU's perspective, um, you see that Finland, Sweden, Denmark are members uh, uh, of the European Union. Um, then you have two European Economic Area Agreement states, Iceland and Norway, and also Greenland. It has a fairly strong link to the European Union, so it has, a, for instance, a, a very strong fisheries partnership with the EU. Okay, more specific responses. Iceland was very uh, aggravated by the, the Arctic Ocean Coastal State meeting, uh, most, mostly from, from, from the three states that were left out from the Arctic Council member states. I think that it's kind of natural. I mean, it, they can consider themselves as literal states of the Arctic waters at the very least, and they also want to do marine cooperation. So perhaps that explains it. Finland started the whole Arctic-wide cooperation with the Arctic Environmental Protection St Strategy, and, um, but after that, hasn't done much. So now 
within the last two years, there's been a lot of activities, um, new Arctic policy document, and also there's a, a, our foreign, foreign ministry is, is pushing for a heads of state summit for the Arctic Council. So our interest is really to, to have the Arctic Council functioning much better. That's, that's what, what Finland is trying to do. Sweden has remained fairly inactive. Uh, just heard that it's, it's, it's uh, developing its, its new uh, Arctic uh, policy document. I hadn't heard, heard that before. Thanks. Um, but otherwise, its, it's identity lies very much in the Baltic Sea. What kind of governing structure these three states would then prefer? And if we take into account that Iceland is now negotiating its access to, to become a member state of the European Union, I think it's fair to argue, argue that they, they do, they would like to see an active European Union. And this does not mean an Arctic Treaty approach. And I think that uh, it's, it has been again illuminating that this Antarctic Treaty model still kind of predominates the discussion, even though I thought that we have, we have already uh, kind of beyond, have moved beyond that, that because that's, that's uh, no go. So you have, we, we have to understand what the EU is. It can do this, European Parliament can do these non-binding resolutions. It can provoke some discussion. And it, it throw, threw in this idea of, of, a, of an Arctic treaty modeled on the Antarctic environmental protocol. Um, what is important to realize is that the, the, the Commission and the Council of Ministers that represents the member states, they, did, didn't, they didn't buy into this. So the EU is not after an Arctic Treaty. They are very much following the current consensus that prevails basically among all policy actors. Implement existing treaties, highlight the importance of the Arctic Council, and also if we do proactive precautionary regulation, let's do it sectorally, not by a comprehensive uh, international treaty regime. What about the non-Arctic nations in general? So they can be observers in the Arctic Council. Uh, six of them are permanent ones, and those are all EU member states. Italy is an ad hoc member. As you probably know, Q is growing fast. China, South Korea, Japan, EU Commission, all are kind of given this ad hoc uh, um, participation right uh, to the ministerial meetings, but, but not the permanent observership. Some of these states have already suggested that we want something more. We cannot be below the Arctic indigenous peoples who are permanent participants. And they have, some, of, some of them have suggested that we need to be members in the Arctic Council. Norway, during its chair period, tried its best to, to try to find some functional solution. One idea that they, they tried was to have informal meetings between Arctic states and non-Arctic states. But it, it plays very much down to the role of the Arctic indigenous peoples in the Arctic Council. It's, 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 it's difficult. So there are various political trends that are very difficult to reconcile. So there is this inner core formation. We don't know where it is going. There, are, there has been two meetings, as you know. The coastal states have invoked their maritime sovereignty. They want to do uh, marit maritime cooperation. Secondly, in principle, all the states of the world have already guaranteed navigation, fisheries, rights in the Arctic. When the sea ice is gone, they will use them. So uh, in the next slide, I will, I will just uh, show that. But I think that it's also a consideration that these outside non-Arctic states, if it's China or, or, or policy entities like EU, they really drive much of the Arctic policy de development, whether or not they are uh, members in the Arctic Council, so that's another set, another way to also look at it from the viewpoint of the Arctic Council. Why not involve them? And Arctic indigenous peoples are very hard pressed. They were not invited by the Arctic Ocean coastal states. They were not invited. And also, Ar non-Arctic states are pushing for better representation in the Arctic Council. So that's also has led them really much to 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 rely on international law, to say that international law guarantees them self-determination. And also that plays into their role in uh, international cooperation. 
So this is a Dur Durham map, and you can see at the, at the middle the high seas hole, and then I think that the dark blue um, are the internal waters. So you can see that the the, the other than the, the 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 dark blue waters, that's basically navigable waters when, if, and when the sea ice melts. And I think it's also good to to remind ourselves that that even though we normally speak of the climate change as a kind of linear process, there can be abrupt changes. So that's something that I think we, we should really keep in mind. So, final questions. If the governance bodies such as the Arctic Council were planned for a different type of Arctic, they were very much planned for a, for a kind of frozen desert, not much regulation needed. So should should they be fundamentally changed? I mean, I haven't seen from the Arctic Environment Protection Strategy to the Arctic Council, rather other, other than cosmetic changes have taken place. Can these really counter the vast challenges ahead in the, in the region? That's something to think about. What about the non-Arctic states and the EU? What kind of representation would they, in the long, at least in the longer term, um, have in in the Arctic Council. How can this be done in such a way that the Arctic indigenous peoples, which are permanent participants and, and not the permanent participants, uh, how that can be uh, kind of reconciled with the non-Arctic state interests? And, and that's actually spreading. In the Barents Euro-Arctic region, there's now development that, that that region's indigenous peoples are also wanting to become permanent participants in the, in the two levels of parent Euro-Arctic region. So uh, that's something also to think about. And finally, can, can all this be done without an international treaty? There are, I think, many schools of thought on this issue, and, and the prevailing one is that, that we go for sectoral regulation. So we, we then probably implement, uh, um, make, a, make an air, uh, regional fisheries ma management organization if one is needed. Uh, uh, for, the, for the Arctic Ocean, for Australian highly migratory fish stocks, or we make the polar code mandatory, or, or we adopt the search and rescue instrument uh, within, under the auspices of the Arctic Council. Um, I think that one thing that, that uh, for me, when, when, when me and Eric Molinar we did a report, a fairly large report to the WWF Arctic, that, that what we see as problematic in that is, is just place more fragmentation in the, the area. And, and I think that, that with, with institutional solutions, there could be more consistency of approach of, of regulating different uses in the long run. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Timo. <coughs> so Franz has given us why Germany thinks it belongs. Ted's informed us that the Arctic Ocean is international, and Timo's looked at what some other states want. So <clears throat> I'm going to turn the questions over to you folks, um, and please wait for the microphone, and it would be helpful if you could identify yourself as well. The microphone is because you're being webcast and we want your voice picked up. Can we start over here, and then we'll go over here. Laura, over here. <coughs> My name's Thomas Grindley. Mr. McDorman mentioned that Russia is by far the major participant in the Arctic Council. Is there a danger, willy-nilly, that it will dominate its activities? Um. What I actually said, uh, sorry, not to contradict you, but to contradict you, uh, I didn't say that Russia was the dominant player in the Arctic Council. I said that Russia was by far the dominant player in the Ar central Arctic Ocean Basin in terms of their geography and in terms of the people and in terms of their industry. Uh, I'm not the right person to, I can't answer it, but there are actually others who know better than I do the role that Russia plays in the Arctic Council. And, I'll turn to my colleague Timo if he wishes to answer that. Well, it, uh, it has played a fairly 
constructive role within the limits of what the Arctic Council can do. And I think that um, Russia has, uh, by and large, tried to contribute. For instance, the, the search and rescue instrument. I think it was, uh, and this is very, it was, it, it, it's not really kind of, it's a kind of an in-between type of process. It's not exactly an Arctic Council process. It started out as, as, as a U.S.-led initiative. And um, when I was asking this in 2008 in one conference from, from the uh, U.S. senior Arctic official, and why, why didn't you use the Emergency Prevention Preparedness and Response Working Group of the Arctic Council? Well, you know, we want to do it you know, our, in our own, on our own terms. So they weren't doing it within the structures of the Arctic Council, but now, and, and that's my understanding, that at the insistence of Russia, uh, they, they are aiming to, to have a, a legally binding uh, search and rescue instrument. And, and that's very much Russians have, have been uh, uh, pushing for that. And uh, the idea is now to, to, to then adopt it in, in the next ministerial meeting. So let's see. Somewhat just on the Russian, and I'm not a Russian expert at all, uh, but it is interesting uh, that in uh, the Ottawa had a in Ottawa was it last year this year we had a, there was another Arctic Five meeting and this is the one where the uh, Secretary of State of the United States did a press conference sort of saying Arctic Five may not be a very good way. It's interesting to note uh, that in the English press coming out of Russia, that the Russian Foreign Minister thought no the Arctic Five has a role to play and should continue to have a role to play. And all I'm saying is that the, you know the, the, the Russians have a you know do have different perspectives. On some on some of these issues, um, and they are, you know, what's happening in the Arctic on a day-to-day -day basis is actually happening in the Russian area. I mean, the shipping and there's in the Russian area, the science, well, that's all over the place. But there's uh, we've seen, uh, you know, the amount of oil and gas not activity f from the seafloor, but the amount of stuff that's coming out of Russia. So I mean, they they are the they're there, they're doing it. There was a question over here. <clears throat> Hi, this is uh, kind of a legal question. So, if this Could is. Could you identify yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Steve Calder. I'm with GAO. Uh, Ted, this is a legal question, so I'm going to send it to you, but others are welcome to add as well. So, from an international legal perspective, do the indigenous people have any standing? Uh, as a good lawyer, what do you mean by standing? <laughs> <laughs> Have a UN structure. And the answer to that, in the UN structure, the answer would be depends on where in the UN structure. They are not a state, if that's your question. Yeah, that was my question. In and terms of UN is based on states, they're not states. So, what are the implications of that, I guess? Uh, that they're not states. The Arctic is, the Arctic, I'm looking at Betsy here, the Arctic Council is a unique animal. It is actually not treaty based. So from, a, from the international law purists, and, and I'm one of those, uh, the international law purist point of view, uh, it's not an international treaty. Therefore, the permanent participation participants are not being treated in a state-like manner because there's no treaty. Having said that, uh, they play a very fundamental role within the Arctic Council. And it's, it's, so it's one of the unique bodies that does uh, recognize a separate existence for indigenous uh, peoples of the Arctic region. It, it is worth noting, at the risk of getting myself in enormous trouble, that the indigenous people are also citizens of the countries. So they, you know, the, the government of Canada also speaks for its citizens, which would include uh, the Inuit uh, of the North, the indigenous peoples throughout the country. Let me let me follow up on that. That um, agree fully with with my legal colleague. Um, there is a process in motion under the, that, that's actually under the Nordic Council it started, which is a draft Nordic Sami Convention between Finland, Sweden and, and Norway and their Sami populations. So the idea would, and the draft, draft is, uh, was submitted in 2005. There they, have, they, there they are given very strong, um, almost like a, a treaty partner. Um, the Sami parliaments are given almost like a treaty partner uh, role. And unfortunately, 
largely because of that and, and because of the resistance from the foreign ministries and their legal departments, the, the draft has really, you know, dragged on. So that's, that's really, um, there's another postponement for even starting the negotiations. So, uh, good question. Well, I have a question. Um, and it came up in the earlier panel about, it was mentioned that the, the Europeans were turned down for observer status, and I believe Timo talked about other countries sort of lining up um, we could only do so much in this conference, but I heard rumblings earlier in the as the conference is beginning to start today about China. <coughs> um, could you mention China's interests and where China is at? And um, I'll look at my colleague to see if I get it right. Um, uh, Whitney uh, Lackenbauer and I spent a little bit of time in China talking to some senior, senior officials on Arctic stuff. Um, their primary interest is research. They do have a new uh, icebreaker. The, um, it's interesting that they tell us, and I have no reason to doubt it, that the uh, Polar Research Center in Shanghai within two years will be the largest polar research center in the world in terms of capabilities. They'll have two icebreakers. Um, that they'll be working with. Uh, the icebreaker that's actually in the Arctic is not an icebreaker, <laughs> as we found out. It is ice strengthened, um, which for in the technical world means that it, you know, there's only so much ice it can go through. It does test where it can go as um, sort of a male phenomenon of testing to see how far you can go and jumping off of rocks and things like that. So they're testing that a little bit. Uh, we're not sure, we, we're not able to assess where the ice the, uh, sort of the navigational ice knowledge was coming from. Um, I think China does have an interest in the, in, in the Arctic ge generally. Uh, it is clear from our understanding that they see the Arctic Ocean as another ocean. They see international law and the ways that I was describing it as applying. They have no pretense whatsoever that they have a claim in the Arctic Ocean. They may like to be the recipient of the oil and gas uh, but that's a different kind of issue. I think China's interest in the Arctic Council and more general in the Arctic is that China is increasingly seeing itself as an international player and as an international player this is what they do. International players, interna you know, serious international countries participate in the same way that the United States participates in a large number of different bodies and so I think their, their interest is more along those lines. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but I get a thumbs up from Whitney. Well, so Whitney, do you want to add anything? Right behind you. <laughs> no, I just think I think Rob encapsulated it very well, at least from what we heard. What was very clear was the or did I call you Rob? Yeah. Ted, I'm sorry, my God, Rob would have had a very different take on it. Um, Rob it's Hubert so was speaking about who really <laughs> emphasized a lot of the the strategic interpretations you could take out of what the Chinese were saying. I think they were crystal clear to say, don't look for China to be intervening in the region militarily to go and insert or, or, or try and influence outcomes of clarifying boundaries and resources. They said, as, as one of the, the great luminaries and strategic thinkers in China said to us, retired admiral, you have to understand the Chinese way. You know, we respect sovereignty. We expect the rest of the world to respect our sovereignty. Read Uyghurs, read, you know, Tibet, read other things. They're not going to go and set precedents by intervening in, in ways that violate international law. At the same time, stressing this is not about military conflict here. And clearly, they're setting it up to say it's about resources. They're playing a different game. It's economic. You can look towards where things are going in terms of resource industries and who's investing and buying them up to potentially do some of the high risk sort of exploration and development that might come. That's where we might look to China. I would like to add something uh, by the question coming up to China. Uh, China has not only an interest uh, in uh, research issues, uh, also in the issue of the resources. Yes. Um, as I know, China uh, is the owner of uh, uh, rare earth uh, metals. Uh, China has uh, resources uh, about uh, 2.9 billion tons. Uh, China is the biggest uh, exporter 
in the world uh, for rare earth metals. Rare earth metals are needed for all the future technologies. So it's very important and uh, China reduced by their own interest the exports uh, uh, of 35% uh, during the last three years. So the prices are going up. And uh, on the other hand, uh, in Greenland, uh, it's estimated that Greenland has 2.6 billion rare earth metal resources. So China is focusing on the Arctic to become a very important influence. And uh, the question uh, for all the other industrial nations is uh, how will China deal in this fact and uh, how we will take awareness uh, of our own interests. So I would like to add this uh, point to the research uh, issue. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Pete Martin, Department of State. Uh, I just want to add two two comments. Uh, China's interest in shipping as well. When you yeah. look at the yes. the distances between major ports around the world and the location of the Suez and Panama Canal, uh, the countries or areas that would benefit most or would actually where it would make sense to use the northern sea route would be northern Europe, Russia, and China. To be fair, they also look mostly, though, at the trans-Arctic and, and not the passages of, yeah. any, of any type. But yeah, 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 fair enough. Um, and then the second thing about the, the EU's permanent observer status, they weren't rejected, actually. All of the, yeah. the, the five countries that are, that are applying for permanent observer status, the decision has been deferred, I think, more than once. Um, because the Arctic Council has said we want to decide what the permanent observer status or what the permanent observer role is before we vote on new members. The previous permanent observers were all grandfathered in from the organization that was that predated the the Arctic Council. Um, and right now, Russia may be kind of throwing up an additional obstacle, saying before we even get to the permanent observer role, we have to define what the permanent secretariat is and we need to set up stronger structures within the Arctic Council. So there may not be a decision at the next Arctic Ministerial either. Yeah, just uh, uh, agreeing, you, uh, agreeing with you 100 percent. Um, I think that it's, it's interesting because um, the, the events have been unfolding so fast from, from the two events like the Russian flag planting and minimum CIS record. Uh, August and, and September 2007. Before that, everybody were t trying to get EU involved, it, but it, it didn't have any uninterest. And now it's you know trying to very heavily go inside, and 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 probably this is the transition period now that that we are facing. That's that's my take on. It. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> all three speakers have made very clear that there is sort of an interesting overlap in the Arctic area between things that are national, you know, resources, and there are clearly international, climate change, shipping. So could all three of you sort of speculate a little bit on the kinds of instruments that you think should be developed? Because the Arctic Council apparently, you know, is doing many things already, uh, but it's not, it cannot, for many reasons, do all of it. Uh, we have sort of already overlapping existing instruments. Do we need anything new? Um, do the existing instruments, do they need to be fine-tuned to qu work together? Can you speculate on this a little bit? Yeah, so um, uh, we, we drew a report with, with uh, Eric Molinar from the Netherlands Institute for the Law of the Sea um, on what type of governing structure would be ideal. And, and uh, I would like to locate my argument and our argument in that line that it's, it's an ideal because also the Arctic states have also said that we are heading for an ideal governance structure and they say that the sectoral governance is the, the ideal not the what, the what is politically achievable or viable or whatever so um, what we came up with was was a kind of a, and I cannot elaborate that's why I, I was thinking for this for this panel what could I say about that? Because it's 50 pages, and um, but for us, it's, it's, it seems very difficult to to. If you look at the whole, all the possible 
multilateral environmental agreements and other agreements in force in some bits and pieces of the Arctic. And then these new sectoral kind of strengthenings and, and some of them soft law and when we can debate whether that's, you know, nobody monitors them, for instance. So um, for us, it was difficult to see how, how this could be kind of ideal solution. If, if there is no institutional solution to coordinate this. And, and it's very complicated, the structure that we drew. So I'm not going to go into that. But what I want to say is that, it, is that we, we do build on not starting any negotiations any day now, but that the, the, there has to be, the Arctic Council has to gradually consolidate its already very strong science component and feed into um, feed then into uh, a kind of information to decision makers as to when the time is ripe for for really uh, starting to to negotiate an, an, an international treaty and um, and we, we intentionally avoid the use of Arctic treaty or something like that we really want to delete this um, Antarctic treaty I think me and Ted we had a good discussion yesterday and Ted said that uh, well you know the Antarctic Treaty uh, this discourse is pretty much you know beyond us and you know, behind us sorry so I think that what we have heard today here I think it's with us and and unfortunately the European Parliament was was really the the the, the one uh, that really took it up so um, where the action is today, or let me rephrase that, governments go where the action is. Where the action is is on shipping. And so what's going on within the International Maritime Organization, within the, um, the polar code to ensure that all the ships, including cruise ships, are you know, of a standard that should be where they are in the Arctic. And that has, there's a, I, mean, I can say that with great, you know, with, with great confidence, but there's all a whole series of issues around there. Somebody mentioned monitoring of vessels. Mm -hmm. and if, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a critical issue that, that will have to be dealt with in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we talked about search and rescue, but it, you know, having the standards of the vessels is only part way there. Uh, there are other issues around that. There's, we'll probably also have some crewing issues that will be looked after, but there'll also be um, issues of, where's my st State Department gentleman's left, but pilot pilotage, that usually gets their attention. Um, even something uh, like the mandatory, uh, the Cana recent mandatory, uh, Canadian legislation on the mandatory notification that you're actually coming into Arctic waters, which has had a, a certain uh, repercussions. There are a number of issues uh, that are around that, uh, around port states being more engaged on Arctic specific. I mean, the port state arrangement exists, but it's better to be on that. I mean, that's where the action is. On the oil and gas activity, there is going to be oil and gas activity in the future, but it is intensely nationalistic where we need to worry about, and I, I like uh, uh, Betsy's comment as always, there are a series of neighborhoods. The Beaufort Sea neighborhood which is going to be anything that's going to take place on oil and gas in the Beaufort. It's going to be within 200 of one country or the other for the near future anyway. So Canada and the United States will be able to, I'm, I'm totally confident on this, be able to work out some sort of bilateral arrangements to do with oil and gas in, in terms of the repercussions thereof. Uh, our two countries will have no problem with that, whether it's formal or informal. You know, it, it, that's, that's not an issue. Now, in other neighborhoods, it may have to work a little bit differently. So I, I think those are the two things, more neighborhood looking rather than, and, and then just making sure that we get the shipping stuff as, as well done as possible. From my point of view, um, as I mentioned it during my speech, I think, first of all, it's, it's very important that the European Union is focusing on the Arctic uh, region, uh, because as, as you mentioned, uh, we are also responsible for the climate change uh, by you and our, our emissions. We are our emissions. We all. We all. So, it's uh, very important to discuss this, uh, questions and issues in, in the European Parliament and, and to show the public in Europe that we are responsible for this. So, and by discussing this, it's it's clear that some questions are coming up. Uh, how can we take influence? 
uh, in the development uh, of the Arctic region. So I didn't mention uh, uh, an Arctic treaty. So that is out of uh, mm -hmm. discussion. But uh, a more closer cooperation and uh, the development uh, to uh, uh, meet with only five is not the development I prefer. So the question is, why only these five meet together? We have the Arctic Council. And the question is coming up, if they didn't invite uh, the indigenous people and didn't invite uh, the other three, what are their interests to discuss uh, only with a group of five? So that's a question. It's, it's on the table. Maybe that's the right for, but it's a I'm political question. I, I, I discuss this point from the political point of view. So, and then we have the, the, the interest to become uh, uh, a permanent observer by the European Union. And as we are the biggest economic player and uh, the biggest maybe economic polluter, <laughs> I think it would be very good to have us, uh, the European Union, on the, on, on the table uh, in, the, in the Arctic Council. But let me give uh, two or three ideas uh, for, for, for a better cooperation. Uh, Torvald Stoltenberg published uh, in, in, in this paper certain mm -hmm. recommendations for a better coordination of the, of the Nordic countries. And uh, some of uh, this recommendation could be a good example to discuss uh, in, in the Arctic Council. Uh, for example, no, to, to develop a Nordic maritime monitoring system. Uh, I think there is a need for a maritime response force. Uh, uh, we discuss uh, the, the, the need to, to have a common search and rescue system. You, you mentioned that uh, German uh, citizens are the passengers on the cruise ships uh, on board. Yes, so, but the, the Arctic is very attractive. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it's a touristic uh, aim. But uh, not only for the cruise ships, uh, the question is coming up. Uh, the question is coming up for, for, the, for the exploration activities, for research activities, for oil and gas exploration, and so on. There's no developed common search and rescue system in, uh, in the Arctic Sea. So I think that could be a very soft issue, a very soft issue to deal with and uh, to win trust together, because uh, we, we, we hear the questions, hey, what are the Russians thinking, and are they the major player, and, and so on. And I think we have to, we have to deal with trust. Uh, Jonas uh, Störe, the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, of Norway, uh, informed us uh, about the, the, the way to, to, to find a solution for this uh, 40 years ongoing uh, border conflict with, with, with Russia. And one of the main elements was trust. Trust, trust, to, to, to bring trust on the table and to deal with it, and then we will find a solution. That was that because I mentioned there, there is also space enough for bilateral agreements and bilateral solutions. Uh, and uh, let me say it here in, 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 in Washington, Russia is uh, the biggest neighbor for us in Germany, in Europe. And uh, we have a lot of problems to solve. And from my perspective, there is a need to integrate Russia by solving these uh, this, this problems. If we exclude Russia, we will never solve the problems we, we have in, in, in Europe. So there is a, a very strong neighborhood. And at the moment, uh, we, have to, we have to see what happens in Russia. I, from my perspective, see there is an, there's an open window I don't know when it will be closed. <laughs> There's an open window of opportunities to deal with Russia on the level of the, uh, of the EU with uh, the development of a EU partnership and uh, EU partnership of uh, modernization and then and, 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 and see what's happened between the, 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 the Polish and the Russian relationships uh, during the last three and uh, four, four months. So there is a very good ongoing process, and I, I think we have to strengthen this, uh, this process and to invite the Russians to come on board and to, to solve the problems together with us. Okay, I have three questions. I have Can I, one. Yeah, sorry, Ted, I just on. want to respond to one thing that, that was said. I agree with everything, most of it, some of it. The Arctic Five Ilyasat meeting, what's missing here is context. People don't remember now why 
what was the context? Well, two things, really. You had the European Parliament making interesting comments about the Antarctic Treaty. And while we've all killed it off in our own little thinking and everything, but at the time, and more importantly, what was going on when the Iliusat Declaration was the Arctic Five saying law of the sea was going to apply, it came after the Russians put the flag. There was all the stuff in the newspapers, almost all of it wrong, of course, about, not of course, but wrong, on terms of the natural resource race and the battles and the arguments and all that sort of stuff. The Iliusat Declaration very clearly stated that the five countries that have the most interest in the resources on the seafloor were cooperating. And at some level, that's all that the, the Arctic Five Iliusat Declaration demonstrated. Now, we look back and we can read into all sorts of interesting things, but at the time, that's all it was about, in my opinion. Okay, in that, <clears throat> looking at time, I think we'll take the questions one, two, three, and have the panelists answer that. So, the first one over here, and then second one over here, and third one in the back. Um, Romaric Rouignan, the French Embassy here in DC. Uh, it's not actually a, a question, but rather two comments. The first one to uh, to say, uh, well, we fully share uh, what Franz Turnus has said about uh, the need for expanded scientific research, uh, more inclusive cooperation, the need for legally binding uh, norms and things like that. I mean, we think it's uh, not a treaty necessarily, but uh, anyway. Um, and the second uh, comment on the um, also the the climate change issue, and uh, there was a gentle call from uh, Ted McDormand for. Europe to uh, deal with it maybe more aggressively before lecturing others. All of us. And so, well, we think uh, we we are doing already a lot, and we certainly welcome that uh, other nations of uh, among the the five countries around the Arctic join this effort uh, yeah, with a renewed interest. That's a very big interest for us. But also, we all know very well the challenges that face uh, the quest for. Uh, uh, broadened and a comprehensive uh, framework to deal with climate change. We know it will be very hard, very tough. And so there is a real need to show that on the ground, before we reach this, uh, this comprehensive framework, we are a scoring point. So we are acting on, on forestry with international cooperation to restore forestry in, uh, in different parts of the world and these includes uh, very inclusive corporations. We will, uh, the U.S. launch the clean energy ministerial uh, process in order to, to, to reach uh, very concrete steps for the expansion of uh, use of clean technologies in uh, producing energy. So we just think that um, it, um, the Arctic is a real good uh, case study for improved and expanded cooperation uh, both for mitigation and for adaptation on climate change. Okay, the woman next to Pia. <clears throat> Wait for the microphone. Possibly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Possib I'm Helen Rafael, Resources for the Future, an environmentalist, I am. And uh, I I've gathered from what you've been saying in general that the major countries of the world, including the two major sources of global warming, uh, China and the United States, perhaps are not really serious about combating global warming because there are so many advantages to, in transit and resources up in the Arctic. So should I be discouraged from the point of view of expecting any major uh, implementation of climate change possibilities? Okay. In the back. Uh, thank you. Elizabeth McClanahan with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and also serve as the U.S. Representative to the Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group, PAME. Uh, just some comments uh, on uh, one of the questions we heard earlier on international governance to point out a little bit of the work that is undergoing uh, within the Arctic Council. One, we did have the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, which I believe was mentioned earlier. And from that, we had 17 recommendations, which now are being followed up on uh, ones like the Polar Code, trying to make that mandatory, working on things like heavy fuel oil and the impacts that might have on the region. Does it need additional actions? Likewise, with cruise tourism. So we are identifying a number of those uh, governance gaps and trying to fill them at least at the sectoral level for now. A uh, second project which the Arctic countries are engaged in, which I'd like to mention, is called the Arctic Ocean Review. And we've had some comments from Timo and um, Ted and Betsy and, and Brooks and others. We're at a workshop we had last week. 
And within the Arctic Ocean Review, we are trying to identify are there some gaps and how can we identify them? How can we work better towards integrated ocean management using things like the ecosystem approach to management? So I wanted to point out that those are ongoing. Right now we're in the first phase, which is just trying to take stock of all the different agreements we have, including bilateral agreements as well. The second phase, which will happen um, starting next year and we'll undertake over the next two years, uh, will be trying to then figure out what are our recommendations and how should we move forward. Last, I can't help but to just make one comment on Ted, because even though I'm not a, a lawyer, I think we can probably agree to disagree on this for a long time. And that's with respect to fisheries, uh, recognition that, yes, we might not be seeing um, commercial fisheries opening up in the Central Arctic Ocean in the immediate future. But we did hear from a number of the presenters and others in the room about the precautionary approach and that we should start thinking about this. And maybe it is timely to, to look at the Central Arctic Ocean and, and what might need to be done with respect to fisheries. I would imagine uh, some are aware of what the United States did in the North Pacific um, Management Council. And we did sort of take action to sort of put a hold on fisheries until we have more scientific information. And so we just agree with a number of the speakers about having that scientific information and how that information can make us uh, have sound decision making. Thank you. Thank you. So we've had comments from France, comments from NOAA, and we leave a question with that. So anything you want to address? <clears throat> But specifically, let's answer the question, because there was one question. We would like an answer to that, but comments are otherwise. Yeah, just also also um, good good that you took up the, the Arctic Ocean Review. I also commented on that, and very interesting project. About the climate change, I would, I would more look into what was not achieved in Copenhagen rather than anything else. So I think it was a failure. Um, countries committed to, within January, to, to make you know, reduction commitments, and, and this didn't happen. Now it seems that uh, there is a stalemate in the negotiations. So I would tend to see the situation as, as very difficult. Let's put it this way. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Okay. <clears throat> Back. I work for Population Connection, a nonprofit in DC. Um, my question is Betsy uh, mentioned several effects of climate change, but I wanted to know who will be responsible. Um, Ted mentioned that you know these countries are so environmentally responsible. So who will be responsible for the effects that happen? For example, um, displaced people, refugees from sea level rise, etc. The risk of being flippant is kind of outside my pay grade. Uh, those are global issues that over time will be try to be dealt with. I mean, that's the simple answer. In terms of specific issues, uh, we're seeing in Canada, and, the, and I speak for Canada and, I'll, and, and what's happening in the United States. I mean, the national, the regional, the local governments, of course, are responsible for the difficulties that are arising because of global climate change. That's not going to that's not going to change. If what you're suggesting is some kind of international responsibility, I'm not sure that's really going to happen. I mean, I'm not sure how you can I'm not sure how we can pin what's happening what that we can connect what's happening in the Arctic and global on our on our German friends. Uh, nor should we think about that and or our French friends come to think of it. Uh, because or the Canadians or the Americans or or any or, or any of us. So uh, you know at that level I'm a little less heroic is a nice way to put it. And I'm not a heroic kind of guy, so I just can't answer that. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thanks for a very interesting question. I think that there, are, there has been some of the small island states have, have announced occasionally that they will sue one or the other of the biggest ga greenhouse gas emitters. There are so many jurisdictional, et cetera, obstacles to, to take these into international legal proceedings. That, And what we witnessed with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, probably many of you know that the Inuit Circumpolar Council um, uh, lodged a human rights petition against the United States which was at the time in 2005 the, the biggest still, still the biggest greenhouse gas emitter and um, that was that went to the inter-american commission on, on on human rights um, but uh, they they found it uh, uh, inad inadmissible uh, the idea was that that the u.s as the biggest greenhouse gas emitter is 
indirectly then violating many of the human rights of Inuit, especially their right to culture, basically kind of culture of dying with the snow and ice leaving. So that would that was the idea, but it's very I, I, I'm I would I would share Ted's view on this also. I mean it's it's very, very difficult to use these international legal me mechanisms for, for allocating uh, legal guilt. Everything is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but but I think we 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 sh are all responsible, especially the industrial nations, to fight uh, against uh, the climate change. Uh, but I think we we we, we have uh, a, a lot of common institutions, and we have to use them. And I think that is a big advantage that we have uh, 27 member states, for example, in the European Union, to discuss these questions in the European Parliament and to develop a common responsibility and to develop common aims and to control these aims. So that is unique in the, in, in, in the world. Uh, we, 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 not, uh, we are not uh, successful in, in every issue, but uh, to develop common responsibility, to develop common aims, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good structure. And by this way, I'm fascinated from, from other common uh, institutions, like the, the, the Arctic Council or parliamentary bodies, because it's, it's even better to discuss the problems together than uh, to discuss the problems only at home and to, 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 to make only national centralized uh, uh, solutions. Uh, so this way, I deal furthermore with the European Union and uh, try to develop uh, the other common institutions. Any last comments or from our first panel? Betsy, your name's been brought up continually this uh, this panel, but um, Denela or Joel, anything you want to add to? Okay, well then I would like to thank them and invite Pia to come up, um, or you can do it from right there. Um, Pia needs a microphone. Yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, and uh, thanks very much to all of our speakers and our excellent moderators um, for this, I think, in my opinion, very enlightening um, uh, two sessions. I think it's also sort of a little bit wind in our sails uh, because it makes me believe that taking this issue up and trying to do it as we have done, bringing the Arctic nation representatives and the non-Arctic nation representatives together for discussion is part of an effort that we have been uh, describing. Um, what I'm going to do is going to be very, very exemplary, not representative of all of the things that have been done, so bear with me. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've outlined the fact that we are dealing with a new context, globalization and climate change. Um, and so the Arctic issue is indeed beginning to have an effect beyond the intermediate region. I think it was very interesting that people used the, the phrase coastal states. And I think, Timo, you at some point said we used to think of it as a, as a frozen desert. And now it's coastal states. And I think that word coastal brings it home. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's clear that the coastal states have are primarily and first and foremost affected by it and, and w respond to it. Uh, though it's also become clear that the question of who is an Arctic state is, is still not quite really clearly decided. And I think uh, I too like the idea of neighborhoods, you know, both in the, within a country there are neighborhoods and there are neighborhoods like the US and Canada uh, and then beyond that. And then there are in some ways you have overlapping neighborhoods and as you pointed out, Betsy, you know, neighbors pull people in, which does mean that, you know, lower the, the lower 48 is what people say uh, from Alaska looking into the US. I don't know how the uh, uh, Norway would look at the lower uh, 20 <laughs> of the European nation. You know, y you do get new people who are being pulled in. And I think it's very clear uh, that the Arctic Council does already do that. You know, you've given examples of where uh, it, it's opening up. It has encouraged cooperation beyond what sometimes com comes across as an exclusive circle. Uh, but we also had a little bit of a debate about the question, is there such a thing as inter excessive internationalism? Because it does complicate things if you have lots of people around the table who want to weigh in but are not affected and cannot take action in quite the same way. Though we also have arguments and lots of experience with the fact that if you have self-interest, that's a key element of making things work better. If you create more transparency, you create more trust. And you have pointed out, uh, Franz, how trust was an 
ex essential element in solving the border dispute. And the Arctic Council can be an important part of helping to build this trust as this issue is evolving. But uh, I think it's encouraging to hear that there is no such thing as an unregulated race for the resources, because we have already the International uh, Convention of the Sea, a law of the Sea Convention, we have the International Maritime Organization, we already have institutions in place that play a very, very important role. Um, I think you know, it's become very clear that cooperation isn't something that has to be invented, it's ongoing. Um, but there's also, I think, lots of room for constructive engagement and for coming up with new ideas. I'm glad that you brought more examples up of how this is being done. I think it's uh, uh, helpful for us in trying to think through how an institution like ours can make a contribution to the discussion that I think uh, we do need. So um, as uh, we've said, you know, the melting ice opens up waters, it opens up questions. Uh, we, um, I think that the Norwegian and Russian experience is a very encouraging one. It's really not the only example, it's just a particularly good example. It shows that there are other things going on and not only the things that draw most of our attention, like the, uh, the, 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 you know, the militarization that some of the people uh, have, uh, have described that, that concern us. So, uh, as I said, you know, I think this is wind in our sails. I have very much enjoyed the cooperation with you, David, and with your colleagues. Uh, I would be I'm very interested in continuing this. I'm very glad that we're doing another conference with the same participants, more or less, uh, in Ottawa. Um, I think we should take this discussion also to other places, including uh, Berlin and Brussels, because we need people to become more sensitive about the open issues and about the, <laughs> the way the perspectives. And let me also thank the colleagues from the Canadian Embassy for, for their contribution for making this possible. And thank all of you for coming. Uh, and I hope you know, this is uh, sort of a part, like you know, a little piece in a mosaic uh, that helps us eventually come up with a sensible answer, a co cooperative answer to a complex and important issue. Thanks very much. Merci et bonne journée. <coughs>